All right, so this is the March Movement Nerd Hangouts. Um, every month since August, I've been holding these sessions as casual, chill, edutainment, um, but also very hopefully practical and useful and interesting movement sessions to help you get better acquainted with a particular part of your body. Uh, as it relates to what I'm learning and studying with the teachings of Gary Ward, who is the creator of Anatomy in Motion. And Anatomy in Motion, in case you're not familiar with that system, it's a model of what every bone and joint does in the body in the gait cycle. So when you take one step from one foot to the other in the space of 0.6 to 0.8 seconds, Gary Ward has created a beautiful map of what every single bone and joint ought to be able to do within less than a second and in what relationship with the rest of the body's structures. So today we're looking at the, the muscle that the therapy world loves to hate and that the fitness world loves to get jacked, which is the pectoral muscles. And I thought it'd be a lovely way just to help people to get a better experience of what their shoulders, shoulder girdle, rib cage, and spine do and how the pectoral muscle group respond to manage the motion of those structures. So I have a little bit of a lecture thing. You may or may not wish to write notes. It's not gonna be super heavy, um, but I just wanna set a bit of a primer, a bit of a foundation so that we're up and moving. You kind of know what and why we're doing the things that we're doing. So our main intentions for today's session are to first understand the basic, and I mean basic, basic, basic anatomy of what the pectoral muscles are, pec major and pec minor and the structures they attach to, to manage the movement of. So we're talking about the shoulder girdle. The shoulder girdle is the clavicle, your collarbone, if y'all just wanna touch your clavicle so you know it's there, cause we're gonna move it. Clavicle is the collarbone and the clavicle, it forms the shoulder girdle with the scapula at the back. So it's like these, if this is looking from the top down and here is where your neck is like that, so this would be, this is the back of your body. This is the front of your body. This is the, what did I say? This is the back? Yeah, this is your scapula. This is the side of your shoulder right there. And this would be your clavicle at the front. So you have two of them. And that is what we're gonna call for today, the shoulder girdle. We'll also look at the, the other structures that the pecs attach to, which are the arm, the rib cage, and because the rib cage is attached to your thoracic spine, we need to look at the motions of the spine as well. Um, in the movement session, we're going to be checking in with your access to the motions that all those structures ought to be able to do in three dimensions to give the pectoral muscles, aka the pecs, I'm just going to say pecs, a full experience of themselves to help regain any motions that might be missing which might be keeping your pecs in kind of a stagnant, either stuck long or stuck short or just unable to do anything sort of position. The main goal really at the end is to help you find a better sense of center through your upper body structures so that if you are someone who feels like you stand kind of like this, or if you feel like you just stand like this all the time, uh, you're just you're a bit more naturally stacked up centered so the length or shortness of your pecs can be restored to something that's more efficient for you whatever it is right now not to make you perfect and give you good posture but just to give you back whatever is whatever your body can tolerate now as as a new movement experience and the word experience is crucial here um, I hope that you will not just sit back and watch and eat popcorn, which is okay too, if that's what you wanna do. But really we want the experience of movement to create the learning in your body. So while what I say is important, the anatomy and the technical stuff, what's most important is your experience of your body in motion, which is truly how we learn, especially when it comes to movement. It's better to move about movement than it is to talk about movement if we're looking to enhance our understanding of what our bodies actually do. Cool. So before we get started, I would like to ask a few questions and you can feel free to pop these into the chat box if you would like to express yourself. 
And I would actually love to hear what some of your answers are to these questions, just so I can see where you guys are at. And some of you are students of anatomy and motion. Some of you, I'm not sure what you do. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you are a movement professional. Uh, some of you are, some of you are former athletes. Some of you are athletes right now. There's a whole mix of people here. So I just love to get a sense of where you guys are at in terms of how you think about your pecs and your upper body structures. So um, do you personally blame your pecs for problems with your shoulders or your posture? Do you blame your pecs? And there's no right or wrong answer. Some of you are typing in no. That's nice. And if you do, like, it's okay to say yes. <laughs> if that's where you're at, because I'm sure you used to, I was like, oh, my freaking pecs are so tight. Um, but I'm glad that some days, there's one person that said, some days I do. Um, yes, it's, you know, our pecs can be problematic, but we shouldn't blame our pecs for the problem. Because another question to consider is, did your pecs get that way on their own? And by that may, I mean, whatever problem you're having with them, potentially, if you feel like you're too stuck like this, or your arms are restricted, how did they get that way? Um, did they just do that on their own or did you have something to do with that? Did you play a role? And in which case, who should we blame? Should we blame your pecs or should we, ugh, should we blame you? Oh, I hate to say that because I don't want to blame anybody, but <laughs> genes, maybe genes, although I'm not so sure about that. It could be, I don't know enough about genetics to say whether or not genes play a role. Um, age could be a role, yeah. But there's this, I think it's a Buddhist saying, place all blame upon ourselves, which isn't to say that we did something wrong, but just to say that we have power. We have, we have a chance to control our reality. Um, maybe control isn't the best word, but we have a role to play in the role our pecs play in our body. It's not just they one day got short or tight. Something we did must have contributed to that. And we can't even really blame gravity. Well, we can, but we also have the ability to train ourselves to be more resilient to gravity. We always have something we can do. So I just like to offer that as, you know, we have some freedom to dictate what our pecs do. And it's not all about what pecs do to us. So on that note, do you currently stretch your pecs? Do you do pec stretches in your exercise regime right now? And if yes, what are you trying to achieve? What are those pec stretches doing? Are they doing anything? Do they make things better? Do they make things worse? Do you know? What are you achieving with your pec stretches? Because the fitness world and the therapy world are obsessed with stretching out our pecs. Yeah, I like what uh, some of you guys are saying to get more length, to increase motion, but it's not the total answer. Yes, that is true. Because we can stretch something but will it be an experience that teaches your body to do something different? One of the big rules of Gary Ward's Anatomy in Motion that he puts down in his courses is that joints act and muscles react. And the, the way that shows up in human movement is that you can stretch a muscle by, if you're doing a pec stretch, like doing the thing on the wall like that, but you might not actually be moving the joints you think you're moving. And what is joint motion? That seems like a very childish question to ask, but what is a joint motion? What is a joint? <laughs> a joint is where, this is so not what I was gonna say today, but it's just coming up, so we'll roll with it. Let's say these are two bones. Where those two bones come together is a joint. And let's say you have a muscle that's crossing that joint. So you have my elastic band here, which is, let's say that's your pecs <laughs> crossing this joint. 
And, and to get motion into that muscle, we actually need the two bones to articulate with each other. However, what a lot of us do when we do stretches of any kind is instead of articulating those bones against each other, creating the joint motion, we just kind of move the clump around. So it's the difference between actually getting your arm to move on your rib cage, opening this area versus just moving as one clump. And in the second case, there's actually no real lengthening happening in that muscle. It's just a clump of bones moving. So some of us, we have the best intentions of doing a stretch, but we're just moving a clump of bones. And that's where the joints act, muscles react, conversation comes in. Um, it also comes into play when we think about a lot of us stretch our pecs open because we want good posture. We want to stand up straight. But what about what's happening on the back of the body? If joints act and muscles react, so if you're always trying to squeeze back your shoulder blades, you're kind of holding your chest always in a long open state. But we need both ends of the spectrum. We need your shoulder girdle to experience this motion, lengthening the stuff at the back of your body. And when that stuff lengthens, the second rule that Gary speaks about is that muscles lengthen before they contract. So the joints act, stretching all the stuff on the back and from that most lengthened state, all the muscles on the back of the body that then pull the shoulders back are given the stimulation to then retract back. So if we're never, uh, never allowing ourselves to actually go into this rounded position, we're also depriving ourselves of the opportunity to actually contract the muscles back here that pull us back. So in our movement exploration today, we're not just going to be focusing on stretching out the pecs, but really just giving back motion in all three planes to the shoulder girdle and all of its structures from one end of the spectrum to the other, all the way into from here, all the way to here. And that way your body can choose for itself where is the best centered place where it can hold itself with the least amount of effort. And I personally don't consider that I do pec stretches. I do motions of my upper body that result in the pec muscles experiencing length and then experiencing shortness in which the back muscles experience length and then experience shortness. So although it's a session about pecs, I'm gonna be talking very little about the actual muscle group and more about the bones and joints that move that give the pecs an experience of themselves. That is more ideal, hopefully, than what you're experiencing right now. I took a huge tangent from my lesson plan with all that, but I think that was more useful than anything I wrote down anyway. And so why don't we just talk a little bit about where these pecs are so we can appreciate them a little bit better. And we're gonna use one of your hands, you can follow along with me, to kind of map out where these guys attach to. So clavicle, kind of on this part right here, uh, the most inside part, put one of your thumbs there. We're gonna look at pec major, which is the big one <laughs> that covers quite a large expanse of the chest. And um, so put your thumb here on the clavicle. And then if you just take your upper arm, roughly around here on the upper arm and put one of your fingers there and the rest of your palm just go down across your chest. The, this is one of the sections of pec major that attaches to the clavicle and to the arm. So if you just kind of move your shoulder forwards like this, rolling it in, you can feel how your thumb and your fingers come closer together. So that's creating shortness in the pecs when you bring your shoulder forwards. And if you rotate your arm inwards, that is shortening the pec muscles in one plane of motion here. Two planes really, the adduction if you have anatomy and internal rotation of the arm. And you can lengthen this space open by externally rotating the arm and bringing your scapula back into a retraction. You can feel how your fingers kind of spread apart from each other. You can also take your arm up like so, and you'll feel how your two fingers here come closer together. So lifting the arm up will shorten that section of pec major. And then bringing your arm back behind you you can feel how now your fingers are getting farther apart. So bringing the arm back stretches out the pec, this portion anyway. 
There's another portion of the pec that goes down your sternum and actually attaches into your rib cage here and even into the obliques that go across your body. So that's kind of mind blowing that your pec blends in with your obliques. And to feel that guy, you can put your hand, the heel of your hand on the side of your sternum bone here. And then again, it attaches to that spot on your arm. So it's a bit more, the direction of this one's more horizontal across versus the other one was kind of pointing a bit more up the fibers of the muscle. And it's the same kind of thing. You can bring your arm across your body and feel that area shorten. You can bring your arm open and feel how your fingers come apart. Roll the shoulder in, it gets shorter. Roll the shoulder out, that spot gets longer. Now, there's another pec muscle, which is the mini guy, pec minor, and it attaches onto the scapula right in here, really deep in there. So it's underneath pec major. It attaches, it doesn't attach to the arm, it attaches to the scapula. If you put your finger in right here, there's really like a sensitive spot there. It kind of goes down like this across to the fifth rib. So you can put your hand like this, heel of your hand, you can put it somewhere roughly there, just across like that. And so this pec is most affected by or manages most the movement of your scapula and your rib cage. So if you take your scapula, your shoulder blade, and just roll it in like that, you can feel how your hand kind of gets shorter. Well, your hand doesn't get shorter, but the space between your finger and the palm of your hand gets shorter. And then if you take your scapula and you retract it back and drop it down towards your back pockets, you can feel how the space opens up. So there's a rule that if you uh, move your shoulder blade, it will affect the length or shortness of pec minor. And then the arm is where the pec major attaches to. So whenever you move any of those structures, the pec has to respond to that, either by lengthening or shortening. And that's what our movement exploration is going to be about. So hopefully that was a, a useful way of experiencing this space closing or opening. And as this space closes, What's happening on the back will be the opposite. It will open up as this space opens up on the back of your body. That spot will close and the muscles will shorten. So there's always going to be something closing in the front, opening in the back, opening in the front, closing in the back. So you want both those experiences, both sides of the coin. Okay, so that was the super, super simple anatomy. <laughs> From here, it's all just about feeling it. And um, the traditional pec paradigm that I mentioned earlier is a lot to do with stretching and um, doing stretches that may or may not actually move joints. A lot of passive stretching, which doesn't really teach the body to move differently. It just forces a muscle to be long, which sometimes feels uncomfortable, but we're told it's good. So we do it anyway. Even if your hands get tingling and numb, you're like, oh yeah, this is supposed to be good for me. So I'm going to keep doing it, even though I can't feel my fingers. Please don't do that in this session today. If you experience numbness and tingling, ease out of it. Don't keep going. I had a client who thought that it was a good thing. He's like, oh yeah, I'm really feeling it in my hands. I'm like, your hand? Hmm, that's not really the spot. I want you to feel it. How many of you are guilty? Or oh, not guilty, that's not the right word, because it's not wrong. But how many of you have rolled out with a lacrosse ball on your pecs to try to release them? I have done that a ton, and it was quite painful. And I don't think it was useful. I feel like I ended up hurting myself a little bit more than actually helping myself. We also kind of demonize slouching. And I don't think slouching is wrong, but I think that if you get stuck there and you can't get out of it, then you should probably do something about it. But if you can't slouch, then you can't actually lengthen the muscles behind your shoulder blades. And if muscles lengthen before they contract, then you're also not gonna be able to lengthen those muscles to give them the stimulus to then recontract and pull you back out of it and then vice versa if you're always holding yourself up like this actually that's what I just said that's the same example but I have a story I have a client who she thought that it was really really good or she didn't think it was good but she was raised by nuns who told her it was good to always stand like this like literally she was raised by nuns and and I was trying to get her she has shoulder problems and pain lifting her arms up so I was trying to get her to actually spread her shoulder blades apart and round her back. And she literally couldn't. 
And I was like, holy moly. So as many people have issues with um, being able to stand up tall and open up their chest, a lot of you might find today that you actually are stuck here and it's really hard to protract your shoulder blades and actually open up the muscles and joints of your back of your body. So I would just say that because I don't want you to assume that you have one particular posture and that you just need to stretch your pecs because you actually might be a little bit like me in that I had the hardest time actually bringing my shoulder blades forwards after many, many years of training and dance in which I had to squeeze them back. And so that habit was really hard to train. So don't expect yourself to be a particular way until we've assessed how you actually are, is what I'm trying to say. We're gonna be doing some assessments next to see where you are. So just to summarize that before we stand up and move, Pecs get blamed for bad posture quite a bit, but muscles don't get short and prob problematic for no reason. We had a role to play in that. The things we did with our body, the injuries we've had, the specific sports we played, the way that we sat, um, even our, our mind and our emotions play a role in this. Anyone who's ever felt kind of down and depressed, you can kind of feel how you just want to be like this, and hide away a little bit. And if you spend 10, 20 years of your life like that, it makes sense that that might be a challenge to then kind of open up out of that position and get some length into that area. So many factors in life play into how you're holding yourself now. But the one thing we can all do about it is move with the intention of experiencing something differently in our bodies, which is what we're going to do today. So I challenge you to try to do something different with your body. Let the experience of what we do create a new sort of learning about your body and don't assume you already know what we're going to do today and be open to experiencing something new about yourself and trying to move a little bit differently than your typical default way. So on that note, uh, let's explore a few things. So uh, find a spot where you can stand up and be comfortable. All uh, right, those of you who have done uh, sessions with me before, who are familiar with this work, you kind of know what we're going to do to start. And I'd like you to treat this assessment as a study of you. And we're going to try to be objective observers of ourselves. We're not going to try to force our body to do something. We're just going to do what our body naturally does and observe it without trying to control these movements because we're not interested in what we can already make our bodies do. Just what we, what we observe our bodies naturally do without us imposing any kind of mind upon it about what I should be able to do, what I can make myself do. We're just, just to set the stage, these are all about what naturally your body does and how well can we objectively observe that. So this might be a challenge for some of you. Some of you might love this. Either way, it's gonna be good information. So I'd like you to begin just by resting into your feet. And by that, I mean, don't try to hold yourself with good posture. If you like, if you don't want anyone to see you, just turn your screen off and then just, if you stand like this, just stand like that, <laughs> just be you. Close your eyes and just let your body go where it goes without trying to impose any sort of ideas on it about what is good or bad, just be you. And the first thing I'd like you to pay attention to is your soles of your feet. Where do you feel the pressure in your feet on the floor? More in your right foot, more in your left foot. More on the insides of your feet, more on the outsides. Front of your feet, back of your feet. Just get a good sense of that. And the reason why we're doing this is because how your upper body holds itself can also be reflected in where the weight goes in your feet. And if you'd like to try that, 
what you can do is wherever you're standing now, just let your upper body kind of lean back. And do you feel how that puts more weight back into your heels? And if you just kind of lean to the side and then twist down to the floor, can you feel how that changes the pressure in your feet? So we're not just thinking about your foot pressure just for shits and giggles. We're actually, we might be able to detect how our upper body is organizing itself by where our mass distributes itself between our two feet. So we'll check back in with this afterwards. If you'd like to just draw your feet and shade in the foot pressures, that might be a nice idea before we continue on. Let's draw two shapes, shade in the spots where you get the most pressure. Next, I'd like you to try to feel and see in your mind how your shoulder blades and your arms are holding themselves right now on your body. Without moving them, do you feel if your arms are more twisted in or do you feel like you're twisted a little bit more out with your palms facing open? Or are all of your fingers, all of your knuckles pointing forwards, palms of your hands pointing to the wall behind you? Do you feel like your arms float away from your body or are they really tight to your body? Do you feel like your shoulder blades are really rolled inwards? Or do they feel like they're squished together against your spine really tightly? Where do you feel your shoulder girdle and your arms are hanging? And you might not really know, and that's okay too. Whenever information is unclear, that's a really good sign that we want to get clear about it. There's something to explore there. All right. So to do a couple of movement check-ins really simply, start first by bringing your arms up and just get a sense of the range of motion in your arms going overhead. Stop when you first meet any restrictions. Don't force your arms. Do it a few times. See if you notice anything here, like any discomfort, restriction, one arm going farther than the other. Whatever comes up for you especially if there's an asymmetry or a general sense of blockage, you wanna make a note of that. Because the pec muscles attached to the arm, any motion of the arm could be influenced by any restrictions in those pec muscles. So it'll show up somewhere in these assessments. Next, we can do the opposite motion, which is to bring your arms behind you into extension. So how does that feel to do? Notice if there's any discomfort, a sense of restriction, like you just can't move them that way. Like instead of moving your arms back, do you just shrug your shoulders up? Can you do this keeping your arms in a straight line behind you or do you have to bring your arms out to the side to do it? What do you notice? At the very least, just get a sense of the range that you're feeling now, like how far they go, just mental note. Okay, and next let's just move into the scapulae, the shoulder blades. So there's a few things we'll look at with the shoulder blades. And the first one is the ability to protract. So bringing the shoulder blades forwards. So your shoulder blades are this big triangular shaped bone on the back of your rib cage. You're gonna slide them forwards. And I want you to try to do that without rounding your back or I don't know whatever other things that could move that are not shoulder blades, try to just move your shoulder blades and see how far do they go forwards. And when you bring them forwards, do you feel like you get a stretch on your back or is this a challenging thing to do? And that would be shortening the pecs, lengthening all the muscles behind your shoulder blades. 
Now bring your shoulders the other way and assess how well can you retract? So how well can you bring your shoulder blades backwards towards your spine? And can you do that without shrugging? And how easy or challenging is that? And when you do that, can you get the sense that across your pecs, you're getting a sense of length? Can you move your shoulder blade without moving your whole back? Because this isn't a shoulder blade. Now, when the shoulders go forwards, what we want our arms to do at the same time is turn inwards, an internal rotation. Those are two joint motions we wanna see happening together. So now I'd like you to rotate your arms inwards like this. So elbows are straight and you're gonna rotate your bones of your elbows forward. And I just want you to kind of check out each arm and see how far are they going? Is one going way farther than the other? Internal rotation. And this would bring the pecs short in the transverse plane of the arm and the shoulder blade. And if you go the other way, if you take your elbow pit and rotate it out to the sides of your room, this would be an external rotation of your arm and shoulder, which would lengthen the pecs. And I want you to just check out your arms. How well do they rotate externally? And is there one going farther than the other? which might indicate more shortness on one side, more ability to lengthen on one side. And lastly, we're going to look at the movement of your rib cage itself, because we know the pecs attach from the arm and scapula onto the rib cage and even across into the abs. So any movement of the upper spine and rib cage are going to move the tissues of the pecs. So if you reference your bottom of your sternum bones, the sternum bones in the middle of your chest here, and if you go right to the bottom where there's a squishy section, that's your xiphoid process. This is what we're going to be moving. And so you can tip your rib cage up to the ceiling, extending your upper spine. How easy is this to do? How much range do you get? versus if you go down to the floor with your xiphoid, tilting the rib cage forwards and down, rounding your upper back, flexing your spine. Do you feel like one of these is easier to do? When you lift up your xiphoid process, can you feel how that opens up everything across your chest? You should feel as you lift up with your xiphoid process, that it also naturally brings your shoulder blades back towards your spine and down towards the floor. But for some of you, it might not. <laughs> for some of you, when you lift up your chest, it might actually drag your shoulder blades up with you. So make a note if that's happening to you. And then opposite is true when you go down with your xiphoid process, if you should feel your shoulder blades kind of getting just dragged forwards a little bit, spreading apart behind you. So do those things happen for you? Lifting up your chest, how well can you actually lift your chest? And do your shoulder blades go back towards your spine naturally without forcing them? You shouldn't have to force them there. That should be a natural motion. Then as you bring your chest down, can you feel your shoulder blades spreading? And for some people, their shoulder blades, they're so chronically holding them back that just to let them go forwards doesn't really happen. So what we're not going to look at today is the specific sort of interactions that the arms have when we're walking. When we walk, the arms swing forwards and back. And so the pecs are doing something opposite on one side to the other, but we're not gonna really look at that because that's a whole topic for another time. We'll just be looking at what should the upper body be able to do at the shoulder girdle, shoulders, rib cage, and spine. And can we use those motions to help our bodies experience our pecs lengthening and shortening? So now let's do that. I'd like us to start, uh, if you have a blank wall, 
we're going to use a wall to do a ubiquitous exercise in anatomy and motion world, which is called wall cogs. And our intention for this is to start by getting our thoracic spine and rib cage to move. Since all the structures are attached to your rib cage, your arms stuck into the scapula, which is attached to the rib cage, which is attached to the clavicle, which is attached to the rib cage. So we want to make sure that central structure can actually move freely. So for all of these exercises, you can follow along with me and do them with me. I'm going to go pretty slow. I encourage you to go pretty slow too, but if you want to go faster than me, that's also fine. So for this exercise, you're going to put your back on the wall, three points of contact, back of your head, back of your rib cage, back of your pelvis. You always want to have those three points on the wall. Feet can be a distance from the wall that feels comfortable for you. Definitely don't stand with your feet all the way on the wall or you're going to be like, ah, uh, holding yourself up against it. So be comfortable, be you. We're gonna begin this movement by taking the point on the back of your skull and pretend like you have a crayon on it and you're gonna draw a line up the wall with the crayon on the back of your skull. So this back of your head's gonna slide up the wall, which you should feel drops your chin down. Just by doing this motion of your head sliding up the wall, you should feel your upper chest start to lift up towards your chin, closing the space between your chest and your chin. And as you do that, you should feel how the back of your rib cage and spine starts to lift away from the wall into an arch. So do this a few times. Slide the back of your skull up the wall, lift your upper chest, towards your chin, feel your upper spine, lift off the wall. Now go the other way. You're going to think of pressing your back into the wall. So your lower back, your upper back, press into the wall, tuck your pelvis under, get your lower back into the wall. And what you should feel is how your xiphoid process is kind of going down and in into your body and your chin's lifting up to the ceiling. And then go the other way again. So you're gonna slide your back of your head up the wall, let your chest lift. So now your xiphoid process is going up to the ceiling. You should feel your chin and your chest coming towards each other. And you might start to feel some activation in your upper back. Now with your pelvis, I'd like you to think of rolling it, the bones at the front of your pelvis down towards the floor and your tailbone kind of rolling up towards your head. So now your lower back should be lifting away from the wall. So this is a full extension of your spine. With the rib cage lifting, you're experiencing a lengthening across the muscles of your chest. And then go the other way again. So tuck under your pelvis, roll so that your lower back is pushing into the wall. Feel your xiphoid process going down to the floor and let your chin gently roll up to the ceiling. So you're lengthening everything at the back of your body and you can feel how your shoulders should start to just roll gently forwards, closing the space of your chest. So we're going through two opposite ends of the spectrum. Go back and forth a few more times, leading by sliding your head up the wall, dropping your chin. Let your chest lift up. Roll so that all the pressure on your pelvis is going down onto your tailbone, arching your lower back, arching your upper back. Make sure you don't leave the wall. So a lot of people, when they do this, they kind of lean their butt away from the wall. Keep your contact on the wall. We're just moving your spine into two different shapes. Drop your xiphoid down, push your lower back gently into the wall. Not forcefully, just with determination, <laughs> but don't, don't squeeze and strain yourself. Just do what your body's capable of doing here. You get the sense that your lower back is lengthening, opening up. Slide your head up the wall. Let your chest lift up, expanding your lungs, opening up the space where your pecs are. Just let your arms dangle. Don't do anything with your arms just yet. That's coming next. And wherever you're at, go through one more cycle of rounding your whole back into the wall, 
make sure your knees aren't doing a whole lot here. We wanna make sure that you're doing this motion with your spine, rib cage, and pelvis, not by bending and straightening your knees. And doing this against the wall is helping to keep you stacked up so that you aren't swaying forwards and back through space. And if you find there are certain areas of your back that are challenging to move, like you just can't push your lower back into the wall, that's really good information for you. Focus on those areas, getting those guys moving. Remember, we're after what's missing right now that you're not able to do easily with your body. You wanna restore those motions to you. Okay, that should be enough. After whatever cycle you're in, take a little break and then step away from the wall. Before we do the next thing, just take a moment to feel where your feet are on the floor again. Notice if there's any change in where the pressure our pressure is, the pressures are. And it might be different already, it might be the same. And now what we're going to do is the same spine motion but we're gonna add in the arms and the shoulder blades to it to sync up more structures together at the same time and get even more sense of opening and closing of the chest reciprocally. So we're gonna start the motion this time with your shoulders instead of with your rib cage and spine and neck. So stand like your body is parallel to your walls. Try not to stand leaning back or rounded forwards, or like this, or anything. You do your best to just be centered in your feet, standing like a wall. And you're gonna try just to move your shoulder blades on your rib cage without moving your rib cage around, okay? So move your tip of your shoulders backwards through space. And you should feel your shoulder blades coming back towards your spine and your collarbones opening up at the front. And a reminder, you're just moving your shoulder blades, not moving your body, not moving your arms, just your shoulder blades. How much can they actually do on their own without going up to your ears? You should feel a sense of opening across your chest. And now let's try to go the other way. So let yourself relax back to center. You're gonna take the tip of your shoulders forwards. So now we're protracting the shoulder blades. Again, without moving your body, how much can you wrap your shoulder blades around to the front of your body without pulling your arms forwards, without shrugging them, pure shoulder. And if you're getting it, you should have a sense that your chest is closing and the back of your body is lengthening and opening. Let your arms dangle and then come back. Okay, we're gonna add in your arms this time. So bring your shoulder blades back again, retraction, opening the chest wide without moving your body. Now you're gonna take your arms and rotate them outwards, keeping your hands directly under your shoulders. So you can think about your biceps twisting out to the sides or the pit of your elbow here, twisting out to the sides. Your palms twisting to the sides, your thumbs rotating back. The more you twist your arms out, the more you should feel your shoulder blades moving towards your spine so they contribute to each other, increasing the range of motion generally. Again, your shoulder blades should not be going up. See how far you can go into this range. Go, go, go. And then let it go. And you might have felt some stuff between your shoulder blades start to contract there. And that's a nice thing. Other way, bring your shoulder blades forwards, wrap them around, orbit around your rib cage, those scat. And you should be already feeling how your arms kind of want to turn in. So that's what we're going to add in next. Once your shoulder blades have gone as far as they can, Take your arms and turn them inwards and you should feel how this closes your chest. It's not a bad thing. This is a very deliberate, conscious, good quality slouch. And what we're doing here is lengthening everything at the back of your body, back behind your shoulder blades. And if joints act, muscles react, 
and muscles must lengthen before they contract. Then when we come out of this position, it should be like an elastic band contracting and just your shoulder blades able to retract naturally from their most lengthened state. Let's do that again. And we're gonna add in your chest and rib cage and spine. So all the things moving together now, bring your shoulder blades back, just your shoulder blades on their own. And your shoulder blades go back towards your spine as much as they can on their own. Rotate your arms out, palms out to the sides, elbows rotating to the sides, arm twisting in the socket. And you should naturally be able to feel that your chest just wants to lift up. So now take your upper chest, pretend you're on the wall again and just slide your chest up towards your chin, drop your chin down to your chest. You should feel this brings your shoulder blades together even more and brings your shoulder blades down to the floor. Add in a little tilt with your tailbone gently up to the ceiling. So now your whole spine, rib cage, pelvis, everything is involved. Breathe in and out and fill your lungs since they're all opened up. And let that go. And let's do one more the other way. So starting with the shoulder blades, protract your shoulder blades forwards. Don't pull your arms forwards. You wanna kind of feel your hands are just in gentle contact with your legs. Not squeezing, just hanging. Twist your arms in and try to use that arm twist to encourage even more sliding forwards of your shoulder blades. Try to keep your elbows straight here. Don't let them bend. How far can you go? Keeping your arms in gentle contact with the sides of your legs. Now you should be able to feel how naturally your chest just wants to go down. So bring your chest down and in. Let your rib cage tip down towards the floor and start to round your lower back. Bring your tailbone down towards the floor. So everything on the back of your body is opening up. Everything on the front is shortening. Try to keep your head in the same spot. Don't let yourself fold forwards. And then come out of that and have a little break. So hopefully you were able to feel lengthening at the front and then shortening at the front. Shortening at the back of your body and then lengthening at the back of your body. Both ends of the spectrum there. Take a moment just to stand again on your two feet and see how it feels right now in your shoulders and arms. If you just let your arms dangle, you feel like you're standing a little differently. You might or you might not. The idea is that you should be able to sense, not should be able to sense, but you might be able to sense that you're holding yourself just a bit more effortlessly with your upper body you might not have to think so hard about where you're putting your shoulder blades or how straight you're standing. You're just kind of a bit more relaxed as you in your body. Okay, let's go through now. Arms moving in different directions to each other. When we walk, one arm swings forward, one arm swings back. So the arms aren't just doing the same thing one side to the other. They're actually doing the opposite things as we're walking across the ground. So what we're going to do next is an exercise affectionately called arm spirals to replicate the oppositional twisting of when one arm is swinging forwards and twisting out, the other arm is swinging back and twisting in. And so in the gait cycle, one side, the pecs will be shortening, and the other side will be lengthening. Although it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's where we're gonna keep it at for today. So let's do one arm at a time, and then we'll do both arms together. Put one arm out to the side. We're going to take this arm through internal and external rotation, and we're gonna sync it up with your shoulder blade and your spine and rib cage. Those of you who have done the uh, anatomy motion courses and my workshop, Liberated Body, you know this one already. So let's see if you can discover something new about yourself today. So you're gonna reference your bicep, your arm bone. 
You're gonna twist it backwards. So your thumb's twisting back, externally rotating this shoulder in the socket or the arm in the socket. So you should feel your elbow pit twisting back to the wall behind you and feel your armpit twisting forwards to the wall in front of you. And what you ought to be able to feel is how this drags your shoulder blade down from your ear. If yours is bumping your shoulder up to your ear, that's not exactly what you wanna see. So see if you can feel that, just dragging your shoulder blade down. Try not to let your head go with it. Just twist that arm in the socket. So this external rotation is gonna open up the chest to lengthen out the pecs. Go the opposite way now. You're gonna twist your arm inwards. Visualize the arm bone in the socket twisting. And it should start to drag your shoulder blade up and over your rib cage and roll it forwards down to the floor. Keep your elbows straight, don't bend it. Try not to let your arm drop down, just twist it. And if you can keep your head level on the horizon, that's something to get into the habit of doing. Don't let your head get pushed around. Again, go backwards, rotate that arm externally. Feel your shoulder blade get pulled down to the floor. And if you keep your head still, so you don't tilt your ear to your shoulder, what you might feel is that as the shoulder blade goes down to the floor, it's moving your ear and your shoulder apart from each other, giving you a bit of length in your neck, which is a bonus. And I want you to now take your rib cage, your xiphoid, and just gently tilt it up to the ceiling. What you ought to feel is how that starts to open up even more through your chest here lengthening those pecs. And then go the other way, twist the arm in. Twist that arm in the socket, let the shoulder blade go up and over. And what you might feel here is that it kind of feels like you want to round forwards with your spine. So let that happen. Take your xiphoid process down towards the floor gently. Don't go so far that you actually start to tilt your body forward like a forward bend, you wanna stay stacked up with your head on top of your feet, just like you're standing against the wall like we did earlier. Because we're really interested in just twisting this arm and a gentle rounding of the upper back, not a big crazy thing. And then let that arm go. Let's do the other arm. So twist your other arm out in the socket. And now we get to compare if one arm does something different than the other, because for sure my left arm is different than my right arm. I can barely twist this one. This is my arm that consistently gives me some grief or the one that I have given grief and now is giving grief back to me in return. You should feel your armpit twisting forwards, your elbow pit twisting backwards, thumb backwards. Let that pull your shoulder blade down from your ear. Keep your head still, don't tilt your head with you. Twist your arm inwards. Feel your actual arm bone twisting in the socket, like a pencil twisting in a pencil sharpener. Feel your shoulder blade going up and over, rolling over your chest. Twist it in, twist your elbow in, twist your wrist in, and feel how this is closing the space now. Pec minor getting shorter, pec major getting shorter, everything on the back of your body getting long. Go the other way, rotate the arm externally. So just there when all the muscles at the back of your shoulder were getting long, that gives them the stimulus to then contract back from their most lengthened position and pull the bones, arms twisting out, shoulder blade getting pulled down to the floor. And now take your xiphoid process, Lift gently up to the ceiling, keeping your chin where it is. Don't let your chin lift. And if you're on a big back bend, don't go like this. Again, it's like you're standing on a wall behind you. Just gently lift your chest up, but should give you even more sense of length across your chest. And then last one, go the other way. Rotate your arm inwards. You can start right away to sync up the feeling of your rib cage going down to the floor. You should see in your peripheral vision that the tip of your shoulder is just nudging forwards and you can see it. 
If you can't see your shoulder, it's probably still behind you. Try to roll it forwards, unless it feels really, really bad to do that. And feel the length of the back of your shoulder, the shortening in the front of your chest. And put your arm down. Now, just for fun, let's try one, both arms together. So you're gonna twist one arm out, other arm in. I'm gonna go with my right arm out, left arm in. So you can do that too, if you'd like to follow my words. So take your right arm, twist it out, left arm, twist it in. We're going opposite directions. Can you feel how that pulls your right shoulder blade down and your left shoulder blade up and forwards? Now, even though you have one shoulder twisting in, I'd still like you to try to just gently lift up your rib cage towards the ceiling so that you don't get pulled forwards. Breathe in and out. Feel the right arm, the pec stretching longer, the left side pec shortening and closing. And then other direction. I know this is kind of tiring for the arms doing it this slowly. So you need to take a break, take a break. Twist your left arm out, right arm in. Left shoulder blade going down to the floor as the arm twists out for every little bit the arm twists out it should drag down the shoulder blade a little bit too try not to shift side to side on your feet stay centered and now take your rib cage and gently lift it up to your chin you should feel how that gives you access to a little bit more twist when you lift your chest up breathe in and out and relax And since you're standing already with your feet side by side, just take stock of how does stuff feel now before we do our last exercise. Do you feel like there's blood flow getting into your arms now? I'm noticing my hands pulsing a little bit and tingling like blood is getting in there. Do you feel just a bit more chill with your shoulders? How is the weight in your feet? Now, because the, the pecs aren't just this muscle in isolation, they have a specific role they play when our body moves as a whole. And in particular, when we walk, which is the movement form that I study the most, is gait a movement form? No, it's just a thing we do. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at what can we do to experience more lengthening across the chest, the pec, in the context of if we were just kind of taking a step forwards, what can we do to make it a full body pec stretch, so to say? So kind of gait inspired. What you're gonna do is put one leg back and one leg forwards. So maybe put your right leg back and your left leg forwards if you'd like, um, if you wanna speak the same words as me. What we're gonna start by doing is just getting you into a bit of a a stretch across your back hip on the hip flexors. To do that, those of you who know it, um, you're gonna supinate your back foot. If you don't know what that means, just lift your heel off the floor slightly, straighten your back knee, and make sure that you're not really turned in with your leg, with your knee bent and all the way on the inside of your back foot. You wanna have the sense that your ball of your foot's on the floor, not collapsed in on just the big toe side of your foot. Pinky toe side contact, big toe side contact, knee is straight. From here, just take your hips forwards or your pelvis forwards without moving anything in your back leg until it feels like you get a stretch on your hip here. And this is gonna be our foundation. Now, in, um, in Gary's work and in my workshop and in a lot of other um, sessions that you can do with anatomy and motion people, this is a, a movement to extend the hip that is taught very frequently. So I'm not going to go through it today, but if you can feel the sense of the stretch here on your hips, then you know you're kind of in the right spot. So once you've found that stretch on your hip, Maybe a gentle tuck under with your pelvis will help. We're gonna to try to feel that connection 
through the obliques all the way into the opposite pec and add in that arm spiral that we just did to make it a full body experience. So find that hip flexor stretch. And then what I'd like you to do is take your arm of your front leg, turn your palm up, don't move anything in your pelvis or leg, and just take that arm to the side. And remember that arm spiral, twisting your arm out, external rotation, do that here. Rotate your arm externally, feel your shoulder blade going down, feel your chest getting pulled up, and then continue to rotate that arm backwards until it starts to twist your chest over your front leg. Don't let it pull your pelvis with you. And what you should feel here is the stretch going from the pec attachment on the arm into your sternum, into the abs, all the way across to this opposite hip flexor, this nice diagonal line. So we're just gonna go in and out of that a few times and see if you can get the sense of that full expanse of diagonal tissues lengthening here. Okay, so find that hip flexor stretch, flattening the front of your hip here where your leg meets your pelvis. Maybe you can keep your hand on that hip just so you can feel if it twists with you because that will take the stretch away if you let your whole body twist. We're trying to rotate your rib cage the opposite direction of your pelvis. So if you have a drawstring like me, your drawstring should be pointing to one side and then your chest to the other, not both the same way. Make sure as you rotate your arm, it doesn't jam your shoulder up like this because that will start to shorten this length or this expanse of pec tissues. We wanna keep that open if we're going for that full diagonal stretch. A few more times like that. Find the hip stretch, rotate. If your back foot gets pulled too high off the floor and you lose contact with the ball of your foot, you might lose the stretch. So keep the ball of your foot on the floor. Don't lift your heel too high. If you wanna put one hand on your chest, you can do that and then start to lift your chest up into your hand. And that should really give you even more sense of the lengthening of the chest. One more time this side, then we'll switch. Make sure you're not leaning really far back like this. You wanna think of lifting your chest up to the ceiling and the slight feeling of your chest opening forwards not falling backwards. And then take a little break, maybe just go for a little walk around and see if you feel a difference one side of your body to the other. And then we'll do other leg back. So put your left leg back or whatever leg you're doing. And we'll start by setting up the base, which is foot supinated. So there's a bit of an arch and rigidity in that foot. Heels off the floor, ball of the foot down, knee is straight. Don't let yourself roll to the inside of your foot or lock your heel down. The heel should be just like a centimeter off the floor. From here, maybe you can just gently tuck your pelvis to flatten out the front of your hip. Don't do a huge butt clench. Don't jam your pelvis forwards, letting your back knee bend. It's really gentle until you find a flattening, opening, stretchy feeling at the front of your hip. You might have one side that's a bit harder than the other to do, and that's okay. It took me a couple of years to even feel like this hip existed, so it's okay wherever you're at. <laughs> These things take time sometimes. And this is my hip that doesn't really move very well, so. Take the time you need to find, like you know what's happening with this hip. You feel like it's opening up and stretching a bit. Now from there, take the arm of your front leg and you're gonna take it to the side and do that arm spiral, externally rotating the arm. And then continue bringing your arm behind you to rotate your whole rib cage over towards your front leg. You should feel how the more you rotate, it opens up more through your pecs and pulls a nice diagonal line of stretch through the abs into this hip, maybe even down into the side of your leg. 
Go in and out of this a few times. You can put your hand on your other side of your pelvis just to make sure that when you rotate your upper body, it doesn't drag you together as one. If you're moving both your pelvis and your rib cage in the same direction at the same time, there's actually no twisting happening. There's no movement in the joint. It's just a clump turning as one. And we want to differentiate all 33 joints of the spine, differentiate that from your hip and your pelvis. Your arm is moving independently of your rib cage, dragging it along in the same direction. On your next one, think of gently lifting up with your rib cage towards the ceiling, keeping your chin in the same spot. Don't lift your chin. And if you have any questions about why I'm cueing the things the way that I'm cueing them, like why shouldn't I lift my chin? Um, that stuff you can learn if you want to study more in depth Gary's work, which you can do by taking any of his online courses, like Wake Your Body Up. Or you can take my workshop, Liberated Body. We go into the reasons why we're doing these things. But for now, just to get this experience in your body, it should feel like it's right. <laughs> like your body should like to do these joint coordinations because they should be very natural for your body to do because they ought to be able to happen as you walk. And walking, one could argue, is one of the most natural things our bodies were meant to do. So can you feel that stretch from your arm, across your chest, across your abs, into your hip? And then take a little break. Go for one final little walk around your room. I don't have much room to walk, but going for a walk helps to integrate things, let it settle in your system. And let's just check in with things again. Some of the things we did at the beginning. So final time, let yourself settle into your feet. Where do you feel the pressure in your feet right now? And it might feel like you're swaying around a little bit, like you're not really sure or your body's not really sure where center should be now. Just wait until that slows down and you rest somewhere. Or it might feel like you're really still now. Either way, where are the pressure in your feet now? And is this the same as before or is it different? How does it feel like your shoulders are sitting? Do your arms feel like they're rotated in if they were rotated in before or are they sitting a little bit more naturally out? And I'm not expecting you to have a massive change, but it's just nice to note what could change. Now, when you're ready, bring your arms up again and test out your arms up range of motion. And for me, that actually is a lot easier. Compare how it feels to bring your arms back through space now. For me, this feels about the same, but I didn't notice much was happening here in the first place. Check out how it feels to bring your shoulders back into retraction, having had the experience a lot of that. Does it feel like they go a little bit more easily and naturally without shrugging? Test out how it feels to bring your shoulders forwards, protracting your scapulae. How do these two motions feel? How does it feel to twist your arms in? If there was one that was going farther than the other or was restricted, how is that now? And how about twisting your arms out? Any difference for you? And there might be, or there might not be. Not really knowing you, I can't predict what would change. And lastly, just check out your spine. If you take your xiphoid and just lift it up on its own without trying to make it do anything. This is just testing what naturally happens when you ask your spine to lift like this. Does it feel like it goes a bit more smoothly? And how about going down? Do your shoulder blades move on your back when you do this? Do your shoulder blades go down and together when you lift your chest up? Is that easier or harder than before? 
And when you bring your chest down and round your upper back, do your shoulder blades slide apart a little bit more easily? Okay, so who is still here? If you'd like to make any notes, make some notes about that, what you discovered. And I'd love to hear if anybody would like to share. Did you notice anything? What did you observe about how your body was moving and how was that for you? If anyone has anything they'd like to, to share because, I don't know, they noticed something cool, just feel free to type it in or you can unmute yourself and say something if you're okay with this being recorded and <laughs> your voice being on it. Um, you don't need to share necessarily, but it's always nice to hear what you guys have experienced. Or if you have any questions at all, now is a good time. Hey, Monica, it's Matt. I've got a question. Sure. Um, so when we did the one foot forward, let's say we put the right foot forward, um, you took the right arm, turned it upwards, and rotated it out. Yeah. So, but when we're walking in my head, which is a very simple head to be in, um, it, what, that arm for me would be going backwards and then rotating in. Yeah. So why, when you do the exercise, do we do it that way? What is the, yeah, I just want to understand why it's do you do it that way? Yeah, 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 just, you just to understand that more about why we do it. You could absolutely do it that way. Um, okay. The intention of bringing the arm out to the side like this is to experience that whole line of stretch from this side of the body all the way through to the opposite hip. But you're right, there is a moment when we're walking where your arm would be swinging back and actually turning in a little bit. So you wouldn't get the same degree of stretch because like you observed, we don't walk like this with the arms going up to the sides. So using the arm like this was more of a tool to experience that length, even though that's not exactly how it happens. What it is doing though, is helping us to find the rotation through the rib cage in the opposite direction of the pelvis. If you bring the arm back like this, you can still do that, but it's just a little bit less nice. Like it doesn't feel quite as comfortable to try to do that with the arm like this. It just tends to get a little crunchy in the front. But this arm going back like this still will produce the rotation in the rib cage. But if you get up and try that, you can do both. You can try this way and just experience how, yeah, it feels a bit more open and free in this arm. If the intention is just to produce that rotation in the rib cage and the lengthening through the pec, this feels quite a bit more comfortable. Then if you took your arm like this, it doesn't feel like it's quite the same. It just feels a little jammy in here. I don't feel like I twist quite as much. So it's not to say that this is how the mechanics are in the gait cycle, but more so this is a tool to help give the body an experience of the rotation more comfortably and the lengthening in the pec a bit more comfortably. Um, but this isn't wrong either. It's just a different thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Yeah, so much of it made sense in my mind, but the the arm rotation just seemed opposite to what I, I guess, what I'd expect you to do in gait, yeah. which, like you say, but no, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, cool. That's a great question. Simple mind produces excellent questions. <laughs> um, okay, I think that there's a couple of people that type something into the chat here, so let me... See if I can navigate there. I'm on my phone, so it's always a little awkward. Do, 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 do. Okay, whoa. Lots of things here. Bear with me here. Do, 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 do. Okay, <laughs> sorry, it took me a while to scroll through. Foot pressure is more balanced, Isabella. Shoulder mobility more free. Oh, that's awesome. Lovely. 
Uh, Lita says, I get a bit confused about whether my chin goes up or down doing a cogs against the wall. Yeah, that takes some time for people, um, many people to figure out um, which way that the chin goes. Um, so just to go through that again, if you'd like, think about this space between your chin and your chest getting smaller and then more open. So when the chin goes down, the chest will go up. And when the chest goes down, the chin will go up. So lengthening front of the neck, closing front of the neck. And it might make perfect sense intellectually. And then when you go put yourself on the wall and try to do it, it's like that. Ah. Um, and there's just a bit of potentially a disconnect there in the body. So go and, slow. And, and is the uh, pelvis uh, anterior, can you talk about the pelvis in relation to that space? Please. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, which we didn't really talk much about the pelvis today because our focus was on the upper body. But if you, because I know you've taken the workshop with me, so we talked about the pelvis rib cage and skull coordination. So let's say that you're on the wall and you're going down with your chin, rib cage up. Your pelvis will be going the same direction as your skull. So if your chin is tilting down and forwards, then the front of your pelvis, if this was the chin of your pelvis, it would be tilting down and forwards as well with the rib cage going up. So it's like a sandwich. Pelvis, rib cage, same, same. Rib cage, or sorry, pelvis and skull. And then the rib cage going up and then vice versa. The chin of your pelvis and the chin of your face going up and then your rib cage going down. Is that okay, Lita? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It, it might just be something to keep practicing because it does take time if it's not a natural coordination. So keep at it. Okay, I think there was a couple more things in there. Another person saying, oh, Petra, put pressure more balanced, chest feels more open. That's great. Enjoy the differentiation in joint specific movement and step by step progressions. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I'm glad you enjoyed that, Lewis. Oh, yes, nice. Scapula, we're able to move down your back on extension at the end. Foot pressure was more even side to side. Cool. Well, there's some good feedback. Anybody have a really bad time with this? Anybody feel worse? <laughs> Hopefully not, but. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. You bump into an old injury, like, ah, oh, my arm. Um, hopefully that didn't happen to you. I hope you respected your body and you, uh, sounds like the general experience was found some new ways of moving that felt pretty good. So what I encourage you to do is to take the stuff from this session that felt useful for you and practice it. And you can do it as part of your daily routine or a warm-up routine, or when you're standing in the shower, that's my favorite time to do this stuff is, you know, when I got, nothing else going on. It's just me present with me. The shower is a great time to do that. And so thank you guys for coming out. If you attend live, you're gonna be entered into a draw to win a copy of the new book and program Strength for Yoga by Travis Pollan and Jenny Rawlings, who are awesome. You can check them out on their I think Instagram is the best place to find them. They created this really excellent book and eight week training program that's to help yogis strength train in a way that is complementary to their yoga practice because in yoga sometimes you don't always you can't cover everything in yoga there's gaps in the strength that you're able to build and so their program is meant to fill in that gap so I'll be emailing one of you guys tomorrow and if you win and you don't want it then you can just gift it to someone else or say hey I don't want it give it to someone else Monica and I can do that Cool. Thanks for coming out guys keep in touch and I'll be sending the recording of this out tomorrow. So if you want to go through things again, you'll have the video of it. Cool. Thank you, guys. Have an excellent day. Thank you for coming out and hanging out with me on a Friday.